The H2O Podcast. This is a free download from BBC Radio Solent. The podcast terms and conditions are on the BBC Radio Solent website, along with details of our other podcasts. The H2O Show on BBC Radio Solent. Good afternoon, I'm Robin Knox Johnston. This week the programme is being recorded in cows. Shelley Jory Lee is with me and we're getting ready to take to the water. Glorious day, Shirley, isn't it? Amazing. There's not a cloud in the sky. We're hearing cows. I, I love cows anyway, but this I feel like we're in the south of France today. It's absolutely gorgeous weather. It's rather like the south of France. The sun's shining, the sea's calm, and there's a little bit of activity around us, boats manoeuvring. And can I just tell you, that's my favourite sign, is the flags, no wind. Look at them, they're absolutely dead. That is perfect powerboat racing weather. I look at those flags, I wake up in the morning on a race, and if they're flat, I'm happy. And of course, it's not perfect for the sailors, but never mind. <laughs> but anyway, we're over here today, and actually, we've got quite a full programme, haven't we? We have. We're going to hear um, from my very good friend, Natasha Lambert. She's got a new challenge, so that's going to be very interesting. And we're going to find out about some new developments in Round the Island race, which is in June. But then we're going to look forward to another Round the Isle of Wight race. And this time, they're actually going to go the other way, which will be interesting. And we're going out to see the new brake board, which of course is going to completely change cars. Yep, brilliant. And uh, I think uh, he's just turned up. We've got Captain Stuart McIntosh here. Well, it's, you've picked a beautiful day to show us your new brake water. Sir Robin, you should know. Cows is always like this. Yeah? He, he says that every time we come here. <laughs> but it's always sunny, Shelley. Yeah? I think the harbour master works for the tourist department. <laughs> no. No, it's a fantastic uh, day and uh, it'll be a, a real pleasure to show you the new breakwater. It was, uh, it's not a new idea though, it was actually first conceived by a Sir Admiral de Horsey actually in 1870. So although we've been working on it for a long time, I've got a few more grey hairs than I had when I started. Uh, it, it is actually yeah, a, a, a plan that's taken a long time to get to this stage. Fantastic. Can you actually take us out to it? Can we actually go and stand on it? Certainly. I've uh, asked our patrol officer to come, up, come, come alongside, so do come out. I think I should drive. Uh, I think we'll just stick with the driver we've got, if you don't mind, Shelley. I was going to do a quick zip around the island, see if we could break a record. It's a perfect day for it. There is no answer to that. Well, Stuart, we're on your launch coming out towards the breakwater. It's really showing now. I mean, we're close to high tide. And it's showing nicely above it, isn't it? It is. It's uh, a really big tide today. Uh, but as you can see, it's sort of panning out to our right. It's just above high water. At the moment, the, the breakwater isn't finished. Uh, they've uh, constructed the, uh, the gravel core centre uh, during last summer. So the, what you're seeing at the moment is effectively uh, like a, a gravel spit that will create the core of the final breakwater. Uh, and it's been uh, constructed over a two year period to, because the ground conditions uh, in, in uh, where it's built are fairly poor. So effectively, this gravel core is slowly sinking. And if they put all the rocks on uh, in, in the first place, uh, they would be starting to head south towards Australia. So uh, the uh, design uh, is actually quite a detailed design where the uh, construction company uh, have uh, uh, cr uh, improved the ground conditions by putting a, a, a membrane and then uh, drains to assist with the uh, uh, ground improvement conditions and then this year they'll be coming back to effectively finish the, the breakwater and put, put all the rock placement that will provide the final finish and the final protection. When do you think that rock will uh, start being put in place? The programme is that uh, the, uh, the phase, construction phase this, this year will start in June. Uh, the construction company, Boscanis Westminster, will be coming back uh, and uh, they'll do the final placement of the and finishing off of the gravel core by bringing an excavator. They'll be reshaping the core to bring it up to its final finish height and it'll be a slightly higher than you're currently seeing at the moment. They'll be changing the profile uh, to its final uh, shape uh, before they start to uh, import the rock that will be coming across from France. And, and that will start in J June 
and will take approximately three months to complete, so June, July, or August, and into uh, September. Well, I'm delighted to say we've got Paul Datson, uh, Head of Capital and Coastal Projects, with us, and we'll hear about the construction later on. I mean, just to paint the picture, I mean, this breakwater is basically right across the entrance to Cowes Harbour, and you've got two entrances that boats can come through. The east one, which is going to be for the small boats, the yachts, and of course you're keeping the west one as much as you can for the commercial traffic, uh, red funnel and such like. But what effect has that had on the local tides and, and movement of the water here, Stuart? Well, as you know, Sir, Sir Robin, the tides in the Solent are probably some of the most complicated tides in, in the world. And certainly in, in the entrance to, to Cowes Harbour, there are some very, very complex uh, tidal situations. Um, but yeah, as part of the initial design, uh, Cowes Harbour Commission, uh, we got some of the, the leading experts to uh, design the, the breakwater and to determine what uh, impacts that that would have on not only the tidal regime, but the wave regime and, and the sedimentation regime. The p reason why Cowes Harbour Commission had put this breakwater in is, as you know, Sir Robin, is that Cowes is, is very open from uh, winds from, a, from really the northwesterly direction through the north and th to the northeast. So, Cowes Harbour Commission, we wanted to effectively optimise the potential of uh, the outer harbour at, at Cowles uh, and help our partners, the Homes and Communities Agency, deliver the new developments and regeneration of East Cowles. And it's you know, great news that they have just recently announced their uh, development partner for a, a £50 million uh, project at, at uh, East Cowles that will include the, the new marina. Uh, but with regards to the tide, uh, what we wanted to do is provide a breakwater that has as little impact on the tidal regime and the sediment regime as possible, but providing us the protection. So yes, it has had a, a change on the, on the local tides, uh, and we're still working with our uh, experts, uh, ABP Murr, and our project managers, uh, Atkins, to really then fine tune the design so that it, it really has as little impact on the, the, the tides as possible. But understanding whenever you build a, a structure in a dynamic flow situation, you are always going to change the tides. Yeah, that's pretty clear. I mean, but it is, I mean, looking at it, it's quite a big structure, isn't it? It's, uh, as you say, it's going to provide tremendous protection for Cars Harbour. Yes, I mean, even this winter, when we didn't have too many northwesterlies, uh, you can really notice the difference, the improvement in the wave uh, climate inside the harbour. And so it's delivering on improving the wave climate, and it's certainly, at the moment, really delivering on bringing increased uh, investment yeah, into the island, new employment opportunities, uh, new, new improved services, and it's about that delivery. Now, where we are at the moment in your craft, Stuart, we're just inside the breakwater, you might say. What's going to happen to this little bit of water here? Well, this bit, you know, piece of water will be dedicated really for the day-class boring boats. You know, the, the darings, the, the boats that race and have always raced out of cows, they're part and par parcel of the history of, of, of cows. So this shelter piece of water will provide those uh, day-class boats that don't have engines to have a, a secure, uh, good quality mooring area. And presumably there'll be a few more moorings available as well. We will be losing some of the moorings to the south you know, because of the new marina. Uh, the dredging of the new eastern channel, we're going to dredge a new eastern channel that will provide you know, another deep water access into cows and will improve the safety because, as you say, we can keep more of the uh, commercial craft in the main channel uh, and hope that more of the leisure craft, especially on busy times, will utilise the eastern channel. So we'll, we'll be improving safety. Well, Paul Datson, basically, this is your baby, the construction of this breakwater. I mean, it's, it's quite an impressive project, isn't it? How much material have you had to import to build this breakwater so far? Um, so far, we've got about, uh, about 50,000 50, cubic metres of sand and gravel that we've put in there in two phases. We built it up about a metre and a half from the seabed first, uh, and then we put in these special drains that uh, Stuart mentioned that helps draw the water out of the softer material underneath. 
we put a layer of geotextile on and then we built it up to the height that's uh, present at the moment and then that's compressing the material we've left it for nine months since we uh, since we finished that's compression of the material and um, when we come back in June, July time to put the rock on, uh, the, the, the seabed will be strong enough to support the weight of the breakwater. Uh, and where's all this material come from? We, um, as Boss Carlos Westminster, we, we operate around the country and so we're able to try to use um, other dredging projects to beneficially use material that we, we, we dredge from, from other places. Unfortunately, last year uh, we we're uh, dredging the channel into Southampton port for ABP and the material that we see now in this uh, in the breakwater all came from that dredge area so either came from the Thorn Channel or from uh, further in near the near the Hamble so it's all reuse of material which would otherwise have been dumped offshore. Now Paul this isn't all you do is it? You, your company that I would say this is probably one of the most technical projects you do but what else does the company do um, in the water or what do you oversee? Um, I'm responsible for all the capital and coastal projects for Boscalis Westminster, which is the UK subsidiary of a larger group uh, which works around the world. Um, so here we, we do everything from maintenance dredging to capital dredging, as I just described, into Southampton. We do breakwater constructions, rock works, coastal protection works, marine pipelines, the whole spread of any sort of marine works. And would you say that this is one of the most difficult projects you've had to do? But technically, this is a very, very challenging project. It's a design and construct project, so we design it as well as build it. And our engineers took a lot of time to look at the best way to do this. So we haven't had to build, put piles in or anything like that. We've looked at the strength of the soil underneath, and by building it up in layers, using the wick drains, we can, uh, we can just use, use the weight of the material to give us the strength that we need. So from a design and technical uh, perspective, yeah, it's a very challenging project. Was it one of, is it a first of its kind, or have you had to do this before in, in other difficult waters? Um, it's, in the UK, in the UK this is what first of its kind to do, to do this sort of design. Uh, we do similar works elsewhere, working on soft materials, clays and silts, but in the UK it's the first one I'm aware of that uh, has been built in this way. Paul, when it's finished and been armoured, uh, what sort of life expectancy do you think it's got? We have a design, design requirement for 50 years, uh, but I would expect it to be there a lot longer than that. What sort of challenges have you had with this project, which is obviously, you know, it's quite an incredible achievement, so have we had, has things gone wrong, what's happened? Um, I think the technical challenges I've described about the soft material underneath here, there's a, there's a layer up to sort of 10, 12 metres of soft material at the, uh, the eastern end and then there's less at the western end. So, but apart from the technical challenges, I think working in cows has been a particular challenge <laughs> with, the, with the number of yachts and the number of vessels coming in and out. Um, working with Stuart and his team, um, we've managed to do that safely so far. Of course, as we were building material up from the seabed, it gets shallower and shallower and people see a nice open stretch of water here that they can sail through. So that was oh, a particular yes. <laughs> challenge, making, making yachtsmen and, and locals aware that uh, this was going on before you can actually see it come above the water. I think you need to add a few power boaters in there as well because um, I, know a, I know a couple of people who've become a proper. It must have been incredible, I mean, to 24-7 guard that piece of water. I know you put the boys around it, but we don't all listen to the right information that we're given. So have we had any mishaps? Have we had any yachts or boats stranded? We've had a couple of people um, come aground on there, but only, only for a short period, and then they've been, been, been pulled off. But uh, nothing serious. I've come over a couple of times last summer and actually, you know, and panicked and thought, where is that? I must be aware of it. But, um, I mean, when it was under the water, I mean, you know... Well, of course, I mean, if we look here, you can see the boys marking the exclusion zone. So it actually is quite clear, if you understand top marks on boys, that this is an area to avoid. Yes, I can see them now, but when it's all finished, um, obviously we're going to see a brick wall, so you're not going to drive into it or drive over it, but is it, it's a permanent exclusion zone. You can't, you can't come and moor against the wall? I don't think it's going to be that sort of wall, but let's ask Stuart. Stuart, once the, the breakwater's been armoured, presumably the boys will disappear. You will rely on people's common sense and eyesight to avoid it. That, that's correct. We've uh, installed a, an exclusion zone that's well lit uh, and marked by uh, large ye yellow boys. As I say, we promulgated that with notice to mariners, and by and large, the yachtsmen have been incredibly good. We've had only a, a handful of inc incidents uh, last year and uh, over this winter. 
uh, the exclusion zone will need to stay in place uh, for uh, this coming uh, season while we complete the build and we've had tremendous cooperation by the yacht clubs uh, and we're working with Boscalis Westminster uh, because when uh, Boscalis Westminster build this breakwater they have to take advantage of the sort of summer weather uh, and of course that summer weather is when all the yacht clubs are hosting their events and we've got a fantastic uh, calendar of major events throughout this summer this year so uh, we, we uh, work, continue to work with the yacht clubs and uh, you know that co joint cooperation has worked it's kept uh, the construction zone, zone safe uh, and it's kept the yachtsmen safe and it's, it, it hasn't had too much impact uh, on, the, on the yachting events. But I do want to just pick up on one of the points that Shelley made mm. when she said, Robin, when it's finished, it'll be just a brick wall. <laughs> Shelley, it won't be a brick wall. It will be a, a beautiful rock structure. So actually, just looking at, over to the west, if, if you look at the northern side of the Raw Yacht Squadron's breakwater, yes. you'll see that sort of rock structure well, I'm that, that is quite artistic, yeah, quite, yeah, quite attractive, but also it will create a, a fantastic new marine habitat for, for lots of marine and diverse creatures. So, okay. you know, it's, well, not, it's, not a brick, it's not a brick wall. <laughs> Thank you, Stuart, and I'm, I'm glad you're going to make it look very pretty. And you've just answered my next question, which means if it's going to be the rugged look like that we obviously won't be able to come up and moor alongside it and have a sort of picnic on the top. No, we will, uh, when it's c completed at the end of next summer, we will have an exclusion zone, but it'll be a, a very small exclusion zone, really, because a lot of yachtsmen uh, won't notice, that especially on high water, we're at high water at the moment, we're quite close to the uh, breakwater, but the breakwater is a pyramid shape. So a lot of yachtsmen won't know where the toe of the breakwater is. Right. So we will be marking the toe of the breakwater and have that as an exclusion zone there. OK. So you can't pit me there, Shelley. I'm afraid you have to find somewhere else. I just thought it would be a bit, it's like a perfect position to sit there and watch the world go by from. H2O on BBC Radio Solent. Well, Paul, thank you very much indeed for coming out with us and showing us what I think is a remarkable piece of engineering. And it's certainly going to be... Actually, one of the most influential things on the Solent for some considerable time. This is going to make a big difference to yacht racing and indeed the uh, commercial traffic. Fascinating bit of engineering. Thanks for your input. And we're going to hear more from Captain Stuart McIntosh um, later in the programme. But one of the most anticipated events of the sailing calendar is, of course, the Round the Island race. Organised by the Island Sailing Club. And this year, there are a couple of new initiatives, as Robin has been finding out. Well... With me now is Lee Bennett, the secretary of the Ireland Sailing Club. Lee, how are the preparations going for this year's Round the Island Race? Well, we're very excited this year because we're introducing two hubs, one in Lymington and one in Hamble. The reason behind that is that we feel we can only get an extra 1,000 boats into cows and a lot of people go home after the race and they don't feel a part of the APRO sale. So we wanted to make sure that there was a facility for them to go back to where they can join all their pals who've also raced, talk about the race, get their results and uh, get their tankered. Uh, can I just suggest to you, you left Portsmouth out. We did. We did actually contact someone in Portsmouth, um, but they decided not to attend the meeting we had about the hubs. And therefore, sadly, we've had to leave Portsmouth out for this year. But hopefully we'll find somewhere next year. It's a great idea because you're quite right. You know, at the end of the race, I seem to remember it, I normally finish towards the deadline about 10 o'clock at night if I'm in Sue Heddy. Um, but, you know, you're not coming in here. You're probably not heading off for home. But you do miss that sort of apre sail fun. I think that's a very important part of sailing. We all know those of us who have done short racing, after the race you get back in, you've got to have a couple of beers with all your friends and relive the whole race. Uh, it's part and parcel of it. Normally explaining why you didn't win. Um, yeah, generally. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got these hubs, so boats will go to the hubs afterwards and hopefully enjoy discussing the race and how it went. But what about the prize giving? You know, normally you hold that on the Sunday, don't you, over here in Cowes. What's going to happen about that? Will that be spread amongst the hub clubs as well? No, it won't. Um, the prize giving will be here. 
However, people will be able to um, see the Raymarine Weather Brief live streamed on the Friday night at the Hub Clubs. And I think that, again, is very important that they're able to see the weather and hopefully Chris Tibbs will be giving them lots of advice. And the clubs you're getting involved with, your, your fellow Hub members are? The Royal Southern, who we work with with Cows Week, and the Royal Limington. So you're keeping up your relationship with the Royal Southern, cemented every year on the Brambles Bank. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, how many boats do you think you're going to get this year? What have you got so far on the entries? Um, we've got 842, I think it was last time I looked. Um, it's about on par with where we were last year. We're hoping that we'll get over 1,600. Um, in about another month's time, we might have some more exciting news, so... It's um, watch this space. So you're not going to hint at it? No way. Not yet. <laughs> no. <laughs> but 1,600 boats, uh, that'll be what? How many people? Oh, that's going to be, it's about 10 people per boat, 16,000-ish. It is still a phenomenal event, isn't it? It is fantastic. And I think I have to pinch myself each year to remind myself how big the event is. I mean, it's about the fourth or fifth largest participative event in the UK. And that's really quite a tremendous feat for us. Yes, it is. And, and uh, well, you know, having been a participant many years, many times over, I mean, it's just such fun. Finding yourself alongside a little dinghy, which you know you should be beating, <laughs> and there's two people sitting in it grinning like Cheshire cats because <laughs> they're level with you. But it's all part of the day, isn't it? It is. It's great fun for everyone. And I think you feel part of a, a great many people. It's more fun. I mean, I used to race uh, catamarans many years ago, but against dinghies. And we were always on our own because we were ahead of everyone. But in a big race like this, you're with people and you can have your own little races within the race and it makes it tremendous fun. Keeps you going to the end. Yes, it does. Have you any special entries coming in this year? Um, we've got a few um, special entries. Uh, one or two I can't mention yet because we're still having to agree that they can actually race. We need to make sure that they um, can get a rating. Um, we might have some GC32s. Um, we may have some big boats, we may have a 91 foot gaffer, but as I say, that's all being agreed at the moment. We have to make sure they get the ratings. Right, this does sound fun. And are you still letting the little boats go inside the fort? Um, you can sell either side of the fort. <laughs> well, not if you've got a deep draft, you can't. <laughs> no, unfortunately, we have to comply with the various um, harbour masters and they feel it's too dangerous to have everyone outside the fort. Therefore, we have to let people go inside the fort. I, I know it, it's annoying for the big boats, but you know, if we can't get permission from the hard masters, we can't have run the race, so we do our best. No, it looks like we can't do much, very much about it. It's a pity, though, actually, because if you can get inside there, you can tie and cheat very nicely, and it does help you. This is why, of course, small boats tend to do rather well in the race, isn't it? You'll just have to race in a small boat. <laughs> <laughs> I have trouble enough getting around in a big one, not a small one. <laughs> Lee, thanks so much, and good luck with the race. It is one of these great historic events in yachting, and uh, I think one of the greatest fun races I do. Thanks so much. And the race is on Saturday, June the 27th. First start at 0700 hours, and this year we should be able to get the winner's reaction and hear from some of those who took to the water. This is H2O Show from BBC Radio Sirland, and this week, Shelley and I are with the Cars Harbour Master, Captain Stuart McIntosh. The H2O Show on BBC Radio Sirland. I'm Robin Knox Johnson. This week, we're recording the show inside the new Cars Breakwater. And we have got some very important guests with us, Robin. We've got Paul Datsun, who's head of the Capital and Coastal Projects, Boxcarlis Westminster. So he is the, the genius behind all of this. But also we've got Captain Stuart McIntosh, who probably says whether he can actually do what he wants to do. So very important guests. We're going to hear all about it. One's the builder, one's the owner. Sort of, yes. Stuart, um, been an interesting winter for you, what with um, very large ships managing to actually be beached in time to avoid a crisis, I think, is the way I'd put it. Uh, how, to what extent were you involved in that? Uh, we were keeping very much a watching brief on it, but we obviously were uh, informed by Associated British Port Southampton that control the, the uh, central Solent uh, and the area where the Herkesarka 
uh, uh, grounded and they notified us the uh, minute it, it, it occurred uh, we obviously started putting our emergency response plans uh, in, into place because obviously one of our initial concerns was any potential impact that it could have on the operation of Cowes Harbour and potentially obviously the, the risk of oil coming out from the vessel uh, and then uh, affecting you know, Cowes Harbour. So uh, yes, we were very much involved throughout the whole of the incident. Yeah. So it wasn't your bit of water, but nevertheless you were obviously could have been very badly affected by it. Very much so. I mean, I think it was a uh, you know, timely reminder to you know everybody uh, in in shipping and, and running around in in the in the Solent that you know incidents can happen. You you can have lots of contingency plans. Uh, it is you know, you know has a great his, uh, safety history, but all of a sudden you know uh, uh, an unexpected incident you know can occur, and you, it's it's important that you have the. Uh, the emergency plans that are ready to roll out and are flexible enough you know, to uh, you know, cover and manage any, any emergency incident. Well, that's when you get down to your real professional side, isn't it? Very much so. It's, uh, it's really uh, making sure that plans are in place, you've got the uh, correct team in place, you've got the correct training in place. You're, you're, you're a yachtsman, you know how important that having the right training uh, the right uh, emergency response plans in place and also the uh, right communications because in the Solent we're all operating you know, with a, a joint piece of water so we've got Associated British Port Southampton obviously you know, the main shipping port to the north bringing up in all these large commercial ships we've got Cowles which is a mixture of a, a recreational and a commercial port that's literally their next door neighbour. You know, we're using the same piece of water. Uh, and then we've got two ports in, in Portsmouth. We've got the, uh, the naval base, the, uh, Queen's Harbour Master Portsmouth, uh, and the commercial uh, port, Portsmouth port. So we're all basically uh, involved uh, in managing the same piece of water. And we have a, a fantastic uh, relationship uh, with regular meetings that we get together, uh, we ensure that our emergency plans dovetail together, but also that we know that if there is a, an incident, we, we know the people involved, we know their plans, and incidents, you know, uh, Sir Robin, you know, they never happen at 10 o'clock or 12 o'clock on a weekday. Normally incidents will occur at 2 o'clock on a Saturday morning or a Sunday morning, and it's those sort of times when you, you get that telephone call you know, in the middle of the night, you're trying to wake up, and that's the importance of having the plans and the training in place that they automatically start to roll out. Where exactly is your port limit here, Stuart? Where, where do you join up with AVP? We join up with Associated British Port Southampton, literally just on the southern edge of their uh, main shipping channel. So those yachtsmen who are listening, uh, North Cardinal Boy, uh, Prince Consort Boy, is really our uh, most northern limit. And that effectively is a, is a line and it's, you go straight over into Southampton's area jurisdiction. Stuart, it was obviously quite a major incident. Have we ever had uh, something as, as major as that in the Solent? I mean, you've just said, you know, how everyone dovetailed together and all, everything was in place. This was an extremely good test for all those plans. It, it, it was an extremely good test for all the plans. And, and you know, as I say, this was very much you know, being coordinated both by Associated British Port Southampton, but also because of the potential magnitude of the problem. It also involved the government with uh, their uh, uh, chief, uh, SOS rep, who's uh, effectively the Secretary of State's representative that can come in and take an uh, oversight. So he has got the authority then to take decisions without having to look at all the commercial implications. So the priority is that you make the, the right decisions as quickly as possible and then resolve all the, the commercial and legal issues later on. I mean, it's a bit early, really, because we're still waiting for the results of the inquiry, but uh, are there any immediate lessons learned from this? 
as, as you say, I think we've really got to wait until the uh, full uh, Marine Accident Investigation Branch report is, is out. I am sure, like any incident, uh, there'll always be lessons learnt. Uh, I know that you know, amongst the, in, in the Solent, we will be having, we've already had a number of wash-up meetings so that we can effectively use that incident and fine-tune our emergency response plans. Stuart, obviously the, the building of the new breakwater, the Hogasaka, they were just two incidents in your whole life as Cowes Harbour Master. Has it been a busy winter? I mean, the, the weather was quite kind, I think. The weather was kind, but uh, as, as I think I mentioned earlier on, we've got, not only are we building this breakwater this, this year, uh, we are also... Uh, in discussions with the Homes and Communities Agency and the developers over at East Cowles. It's a, a fantastic uh, new development and investment opportunity for East Cowles, so we're involved in, in that. Uh, and there's a further uh, investment of uh, improving the communications, the ferry com communications from Southampton uh, to uh, Cowles and, and the Isle of Wight. Uh, which uh, again is a, is a, a government private an initiative uh, which is going to be bringing another £15 million worth of investment into both the Southampton and the East Cowes end. So uh, Cowes Harbour Commission, uh, we've been uh, very heavily involved in the, the management and the planning for, for that new investment uh, into Cowes. And then as I say we've got this fantastic season of events. Now Everybody always thinks that you know, Cowles Week that's, it must be the most difficult for uh, myself and my team to plan. But actually, Cowles Week, we have a fantastic blueprint, and, and we, we just fine-tune that blueprint every year. Uh, I'm, I'm supported by a fantastic team, and by and large, my team just, you know, it, it just seems to, to happen. I just have to keep a, a watching brief on it. Uh, but this year, we've got... Uh, you might know that it's the Royal Yacht Squadron's 200th uh, anniversary. Uh, they are having some fantastic uh, events during the year uh, that are going to be bringing some of the world's largest yachts into Cowes. And it's these one-off events that take an awful lot of ex extra planning. Uh, and they take a, a bit more extra planning than normal because we just happen to be building, having a major construction site uh, yeah, in, in cows at the same time. And of course there have been quite a lot of spend into cows as well. But you mentioned earlier this new marina on, on the eastern side of Cows Harbour. Now we're out on your boat at the moment looking there. There's the old breakwater, the eastern breakwater here, and you've got the big shed with the Union flag on it. Between there is where the new marina is going to be? That's correct. For those who, who know uh, cows well, the uh, Venture Key Union Jack building is a very well-known landmark. So the, the Venture Key apron with the hoist, uh, that it will be extended out and the new marina will basically be running north from that Union Jack building up to inside of the Shrake Breakwater. And then the new Eastern Channel, will be dredging a new Eastern Channel uh, down to about three metres below chart depth. Uh, and that will run from the eastern side of the breakwater down through to just by about the red jet uh, terminal at uh, West Cowes. Three metres isn't enough for me, I need four and a half, Stuart. Where can I berth? There is going to be five and a half metres of water over there. It's going to be such a fantastic place to stay, you just won't have to go out just right on low water. OK, got that, I'll avoid low water. <laughs> H2O on BBC Radio Solent. This is H2O show from BBC Radio Solent. And this week, Shelley and I are with the Cowes Harbour Master, Captain Stuart McIntosh. More from Stuart in a moment. Now, you may remember, last year, Shelley was part of the support team for Natasha Lambert's Sea and Summit Challenge. Well, Natasha has just announced her latest challenge. Well, Natasha and Mum, Mandy Lambert, we had an amazing challenge last year. I thought we couldn't top it, but you're off again. We are. Yeah, Natasha's come up with another plan for this summer. And that is? <laughs> On the 23rd of May, Natasha's going to set sail from Cowes and sail east, round Dover, and then along up the Thames and right into the centre of London. So that's the opposite to the way we went last year. And, um, and then when we get into the centre of London, what, what's the plan? Just to sort of say hi and turn around and come back again? 
No, the idea mm. is it is to more to raise the profile of disabled sailing. Um, mm -hmm. Natasha's going to then get in her special walking frame and she's going to walk the square mile. Um, that'll be a challenge in itself because walking up a mountain is one thing, but walking in a city with traffic and curbs, pavements is going to be a completely new challenge. So we're going to walk to the, the banking capital and we're going to hopefully collect a few cheques towards the new charity that Natasha's setting up. And that is? It's a, it's a sailing charity to help other people in very similar circumstances to Natasha. Natasha has a boat all set for sip and puff sailing and we'd like to be able to offer that to other people that need that very specialist level of sailing um, so they can learn to, to sail just as Natasha has. That's amazing, so absolutely no holes barred. If Natasha can do it, anyone can do it. Yeah, <laughs> Natasha? Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic. Now, Tasha, how's it going? Is, is the challenge all going to plan? Uh, what? No? Not very well. Not very well? Who's ruined the plans? <coughs> Gary. But Gary's the main man. He's the carer. He's the engineer on the boat. What's he... What's, oh, I don't believe it. What's he done? <coughs> He's injured his leg and it's in a, a, a pot. <laughs> it's in a cast up to his thigh at the moment so the cast's on for six weeks and we set sail in five weeks so a bit of a hiccup okay i would say that's a major hiccup where we have now two people wheelchair bound um okay are you we, we like a challenge <laughs> that's a little bit of an understatement are we going ahead yeah it's all going all going ahead we just have to rearrange a few things gary will be sure side but things will still go ahead. Okay, just from memory, if Gary's going to go shoreside, you do need to show him how to turn a computer on and what a mobile <laughs> phone is. <laughs> we'll practice. We've got five weeks to practice. <laughs> Robin, this is amazing, isn't it? I mean, we, we heard what Natasha did last year. I think climbing Penny Fan with all the rocks and the crevices was the hardest thing she's going She seems to think London's going to be harder. <laughs> when you look at the traffic in London, I can see that it will be a challenge, but isn't it wonderful that she's taking on these challenges, just showing what it is possible to do? Now, the, last year we, 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 you raised money for um, the RNLI, Ellen MacArthur and the Jubilee Sailing Trust, I believe. So this year are we purely raising money for your new charity? Yeah. That's right, yes yeah. we are. Natasha's new charity is called Missiles School of Sip Puff Sailing. That's fantastic. Now, have we got any people, have you got people lined up already that want to actually come and join you, Natasha, yeah. and have a go? Yeah. yeah, yes, there's a couple of people that uh, would like to have a go. Um, one young lady from London is going to, to start off. We took her out sailing last year and she loved it. And we're going to carry on this year and she'll do some more sailing with us this year. And where, where are you going to be based? We're going to be based here in Cowes. Mm. We've got the website should be going live in the next couple of weeks with all the links to the fundraising. So we'll, we'll put lots of links out on Facebook and Twitter in mm. the next two weeks so how people can contact mm. us and how they can book. And then hopefully they're all going to follow you, follow mm. you first on the challenge again. Natasha, it's amazing. Um, mm. I was in awe last year. Um, I thought we were going to have a year off before you decided to do something again. <laughs> <laughs> No, <laughs> quite clearly not. So we're all off again. And when is this actually starting again, Mandy? On May the 23rd. Mm. And we'll be leaving Cows from May cows. the 23rd. Saturday, May the 23rd. Yeah. And instead of turning left, you're going to turn right. <laughs> Fantastic. Good luck. Thank you very, very much. Masses of luck. And yeah, let's raise a load of money. Yeah. Thank you very much. And there's a link to Natasha's website on our programme page for today. That's bbc.co.uk slash Solent. This is H2O Show from BBC Radio Solent. And this week, Shelley and I are with the Cowes Harbour Master, Captain Stuart McIntosh. Stuart, Cowes, to me, is the summer mecca. It's like Ibiza, but it has all these great events. What, what's your favourite event? I think it's so difficult to say which is your favourite event. I mean, there's so many uh, great events. I like the, the Classics Week. Uh, it, you know, it's got its own unique uh, atmosphere. Uh, Cow's Week, I mean, that has really got to be a pinnacle. Yeah. Yeah, uh, around the island race. It's just, but, but it's also the one-off events. I think the, some of the, the Raw Yacht Squadron's 200th uh, anniversary events really are going to be a fantastic spectacle these years. Yeah, and they're going to be different. They're going to be different for you. Yeah. 
when I, I first started this job, uh, virtually one of the uh, first uh, jobs I had, I, I think it was a bit of a baptism of fire. I don't think it really told me in the interview, but you know, the uh, 2001 uh, uh, anniversary, the 150th anniversary of the America's Cup was, a, I think, still one of my highlights of, of my time in Cowes. To see uh, all the J-class yachts yeah, and all these fantastic historic yachts all hitting the, the Royal Yacht Squadron starting line, literally on the button as the gun went. Yeah, it, was, it, was, it was just a sight to behold. And I think the one thing that that told me, Sir Robin, was that the, uh, the, the weather god must be a member of the Royal Yacht Squadron <laughs> because it was the most perfect weather day. The beautiful sunshine, fantastic winds, and, as I say, a sight I'll never forget. Now, I was out there. I, I couldn't believe it. You're looking at so much America's Cup history. You said, because that was one by... Oh, there she is. And you were looking at all this really yachting history out there on the water. It was fantastic. I'd forgotten that was your first year. So, yes, what a baptism of fire. So, yeah, so other, other fantastic events. I, the, the Royal Yacht Squadron start line, I still think, is one of the, the best start line in the world. It really provides a fantastic grandstand. Another event was the, the Volvo start that we had from here. You know, uh, and it was uh, on grandstand, BBC you know, grandstand, highlighted the whole of their programme but to see the, the Volvo ocean racing yachts as they were then racing down was just fantastic. I agree with you, I think it's a perfect start line. Great joy being you can start either way, can't you? Yes. East or West. Yes. And of course, wonderful uh, but for the public because anyone can walk along the Esplanade there and just see what's going on. I think that's one of the uh, fantastic unique points about cows is cows we can actually provide a complete yachting village so anybody who wants to hold a really major event we've got a turnkey package and we can virtually you know, hand over the town and provide everything that uh, you know, a, a major uh, international yachting event could uh, desire. Well, that of course is why cows has such a huge international reputation in the yachting world. What is your biggest challenge throughout the year, regardless of the events? You know, is it is it just the pure traffic that comes in out of here? <laughs> well, I think the, the the biggest challenge, and and it's it's Cowes Harbour Commission and my and my my board of commissioners and my own uh, major responsibility is is one of safety. That has got to be our number one and is our number one priority. So, you know, Cowes, you know, as I mentioned, the fantastic. Uh, uh, Raw Yacht Squadron start line uh, running across, but that start line runs across not only the entrance to Cowes Harbour, but it, it runs directly across the entrance to Southampton uh, Port, main shipping channel. So it's, it's maintaining uh, safety. You've got uh, the commercial ships that, and ferries that have to continue to operate, and then making sure that they operate safely with the, the yachting uh, fraternity and the yacht racing that goes on. So it's it's managing that uh, that safety element. Earlier we heard about plans for Round the Island, the historic one that goes west about. Well at the start of June there's another race around the island and this one goes east about. Robin's been finding out more. Well I'm with Dave Cowson who's Commodore of the East Cow Sailing Club. Now Dave you organise uh, an event which might be confused with around the island race but isn't it's called sail the white exactly what is that uh, sail the white was established about 10 years ago to raise money for local charities and uh, eight years ago we were joined by the westerly owners association we it's all uh, down to sponsorship we get low crews to spot you get race sponsorship for um, this year it's going to be age concern uk but we the difference from between us and the main round the island race is we go east about and um, we do a race and also a, a cruising company for those that don't actually want to race. And if the weather conditions uh, are bad, then we have a course in, on the shape of the Isle of Wight within the Sutherland area. This sounds a perfect uh, sort of event for a family to enter. Absolutely, yes. And uh, I think it's also an opportunity for those 
that I wouldn't consider going in the Rowney Island race because of the, the uh, intensity of it, but it's a good experience for people to sail round the island and just take in the views and have a great day out. And then afterwards we have a party in the club. <laughs> Inevitably, of course, a party in the club. And I particularly like your charity for this year, Age Concern. Yes, I think that's something that affects us all, Robin. It's, uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, it's beginning, beginning to concern me anyway. <laughs> but now, how many birds did you have in it last year? Uh, we, we've had about 60 in the past. Oh, 60 birds? Yes, yes. We're, um, we are trying this year to get a lot more. We'd, yeah. we'd really like to, to raise a lot more money. In the past, we've raised up to £30,000 for, for a local charity, yes. And it's always a charity that's based on the island. Yep. And you start from here, Cows? Yes, we're starting from the Royal Yacht Squadron line, yep. uh, going east about, as I said, but we're finishing on our line, which is off the Shrape at East Cows. OK. So, in fact, they've got to do a little bit more than just round the island. Yes, round about the island. A, round the island plus about 200 yards. <laughs> well, it's something to be proud of. And when is this taking place? Uh, it's starting, uh, taking place on the 6th of June. Right. And, as I say, anyone can enter if they want details of, of the event, of the entry forms, uh, notice of race, sailing instructions, etc., etc. And more importantly, the sponsorship forms, they're available on our website, which is www.sailthewhite.org.uk. Well, I think that appeals to anyone who's got a family, a bit worried about going racing, not sure if they know the rules, etc. But they can enter your event, they can sail around the Isle of Wight, which is no mean achievement, and take the family out and have a great day and a decent party at the end of it. Absolutely. And all in a very good cause, as usual. Yes, absolutely. Dave, tell me a bit more about the East Coast Sailing Club. I mean, it's not one of the clubs you hear much about. Yes, yeah, so we are a small club. We were founded in 1912, the same year the Titanic went down unfortunately. Uh, we've had some very prestigious uh, Commodores in the past. Upper Fox was Commodore and uh, Lord Gort and uh, a few other not notable people. We're basically based uh, south of the chain ferry and at uh, one time we had quite a large dinghy fleet of mirrors and 505s, international 14s etc etc but those have really drifted away now to the uh, clubs like Gurnard but now we have a, a small cruiser fleet that we race every Thursday night from our start line on the Shrape. Uh, this is a club really more for local people than for people coming down from town or something. Oh, absolutely. Um, it originally started up as, it sounds strange to say this, but a working man's club. It's very much a small club and we have a yard facilities where people can haul their boats out, work on them and uh, store their boats over. We've got inside and outside storage as well. So we're very well equipped. Yes, absolutely, yes. And uh, we try to keep all the costs right down as well. That's, yeah. that's the most important thing. Yeah, and how many members have you got? We've got about 400 members. And, uh, you know, our membership fees are only 25, 30 pounds a week year. So. <laughs> yes, I mean, it's, it's hardly <laughs> expensive. I mean, yeah. this, to my mind, this is, this is the basis of British yachting, really, clubs like yours. I mean, th this is where people start out. Mm, very much so. And uh, as I say, the dinghies have moved away, so we have kind of lost the, uh, the cadet side of it because uh, people play, clubs like Gurnard do such a fantastic job with their um, cadet ships and um, you know, training establishments, whereas um, our club, we don't have full-time staff or anything like that. It's all voluntary, and uh, it, dealing with um, the children on the water for us is a problem, especially up the, that part of the river where we have to deal with coming down through the harbour, through past the chain ferry, etc., with all the, the strong tides, etc. Well, now, since you're based here locally, and I'm always looking for a way I can improve my racing, you must be the person I talk to about the effect of the currents around this new breakwater. Yeah, well, we've seen some changes. Um, we've noticed last year that there was a standing wave starting to happen off the old East Cows breakwater, especially on a strong ebb tide, and also the cross current starting to push boats, especially the small boats when you're trying to get ready for the start for the Island Sailing Club Tuesday evening series, we've noticed we get pushed into the ferry, into the fairway and the, obviously there's a danger of uh, ferry traffic and that sort of thing, but we found from our club's point of view, our main problem is not the tidal flows in the, in the harbour, but it's actually the exclusion zone that's now around the breakwater while it's under construction and that's pushed our small fleet right out into the tides as we start on the Shrape, perhaps we're going west or going east, they were pushed right out. Uh, but I think that will improve once the, um, once the construction of the breakwater is finished and we'll be able to come in close to the breakwater, keep out the tide and get across the harbour entrance. 
I, I think once they finish construction, I'm going to come and see you, Dave, so you can enlighten me on where the best place to be to get the best effect when I'm finishing a race here. So either that, Robin, or I know a good estate agent, so I think we'll be building a hotel on it. <laughs> Marvellous idea. Dave, thanks so much for your time. Good luck with the, uh, the sailing event. It sounds such fun. Great. Thank you very much. We're here. We are on the reef, Robin. We've, um, we've sort of driven the rib up the bank. We are all on the reef. This is, uh, well, we're not actually supposed to be here, but we are with, with the Harbour and the Commissioner, so I think that's all right. Well, it's his breakwater, so if he says we can go on it, we can. So, but it's, isn't it magnificent, just looking down the sail from here, just seeing the way the breakwater just curves slightly towards the Royal Yacht Squadron. But it's going to be fantastic when it's finished. Well, thank you very much indeed, Stuart, for allowing us to come ashore and for bringing us up to date with what's going on in cows. It's my pleasure, Sir Robin and, and Shelley, and the one thing I'd ask the pair of you is can you come back at the end of the summer when it's all completed, when Paul has, and his team have done hit the, the piece and you'll see the final finished uh, rock breakwater. Oh, yeah, you bet, definitely. Yeah. That's a must. Well, next week we're going to look at the Navy's iconic flagship, HMS Victory, which is coming up for its 250th anniversary. The H2O Podcast. Thank you for downloading this week's H2O Podcast from BBC Radio Solent. For more news on the water, listen online at bbc.co.uk slash Solent or click on our handbook.